Hello. Hello and welcome everybody to um, this event on ensuring accountability and justice for international crimes by Russia in Ukraine. My name is Barry Colfer and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin. I'm standing in for Alex White, our Director General, who's been called away, but he will be back before too long and he'll officially close our meeting later on today. I'm delighted to welcome you all here, um, including those who are joining us in person at our headquarters in central Dublin, and indeed those joining online. We're also very happy to be working again with colleagues at the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs, the Ukraine Embassy in Dublin, the US Embassy in Dublin, and I also acknowledge and welcome indeed colleagues from Ukraine Action who are here as well. And indeed, we should thank the good people at Art of Coffee for the very generous catering that was provided for today, which certainly facilitates the discussion. We are a public policy and international affairs think tank, and there are fewer issues of, of greater importance today than the current situation in Ukraine amid the atrocious war started by Russia there. And today we'll, we will hear from two panels, one on ensuring accountability for the crime of aggression, special tribunal for the crime of aggression against Ukraine, and a second panel on international compensation mechanism and its elements, with two panels of expert speakers. Before that, we're going to hear opening remarks, firstly from Ms. Larissa Garasco, the ambassador of Ukraine in Ireland. Following that, we'll hear from Ms. Sonia Hyland, Deputy Sec Secretary General and Political Director at the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. And finally, in terms of opening remarks, we'll hear from Mr. Michael Clausen, who's a charge of affairs at the US mission in Ireland. And it's my great pleasure to welcome each of our openers. Just some very short words of housekeeping from me before handing over to the ambassador. During the questions and answers portion of our sessions, uh, to those of you in the room, should you wish to ask a question, please raise your hand and a roving mic will be brought to you. And for those joining online, I think you know the script at this stage, feel free to send in questions throughout the session using the questions and answer, answer function on Zoom, which you should be able to see on your screens. We would ask, as ever, that you give your name and include any affiliation which you might have if they are relevant, and to try and keep questions as concise as possible. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record, and please feel free to contribute to the discussion on Twitter, X, using the handle at IIEA. A final word from me before handing over to Ambassador Garasco, the ambassador's remarks will be accompanied by a screen here to my left uh, with a slideshow of images from the exhibition Butcher Faces of War, which is a photo exhibition documenting the impact of the war in that place, uh, which is by Reuters. Some of you may have seen these photos previously. They were displayed in the houses of the Oireachtas and elsewhere. And I just want to warn everyone that some of the photos are quite graphic, naturally, as uh, they depict the impact of the war on Ukraine and her people and your discretion is therefore advised. Now I'll hand over to Ambassador Garasco, who will speak for about 10 minutes. When she's finished, I'll introduce Sonia and Michael. Thank you, everybody. Ambassador. Good afternoon, Excellencies, my dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Let me express uh, my sincere gratitude to everyone who has uh, joined us in IIAA and online uh, for this important symposium. I welcome this opportunity to address the scope of the uh, unfolding human rights and humanitarian tragedy in Ukraine and around the world and to discuss ways to strengthen our collective response. Before I turn to my remarks, I would like to thank uh, uh, our partners in this event, the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, of Ireland, uh, the Institute of International and European Affairs, uh, US Embassy to Ireland and Ukrainian Action. And uh, of course, our outstanding uh, speakers and panelists contribute to the event in both ways in person and online. We make a totally international team here from uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, Anton Karanevich, Irina Mundra, Alexandra Matvichuk from Germany, Professor 
uh, Klaus Kress from Australia, uh, Kerry McDougall and Antonin Moyasenka, as well as the representatives of the Ivra Just, Margarita Snutite Dangelini, I do apologize if I pronounce wrong, and the Council of Europe, Gunther Schimmer. Thank you all for supporting this very important event. 567 days that have passed, have left, uh, have uh, felt like an uh, eternity for millions of Ukrainians. What you can see on the screen in the photo are consequences uh, of the Russian troops' presence in the single, in, in one single city, Bucha, for slightly less than a month. Unfortunately, Bucha is just a drop in the ocean. We have so many such butchers. The scales of such atrocities on all liberated lands is really mind-blowing. Russia's war has killed thousands, forced millions to flee their homes, and reduces entire city to rubble. The continued deliberate targeting on civilian infrastructure has left millions of Ukrainians uh, without homes, energy, and water. The world has been shocked by scope of human rights violations, war crimes, crimes against humanity committed by Russia in Ukraine, uh, killings, enforced uh, disappearances, torture and rape, uh, concentration and filtration camps, uh, forced deportation. The list of Russia's bloody crimes is unending. Since uh, 24th of February uh, 2022, Ukrainian law enforcement agency launched an investigation into more than uh, 100,000 war crimes. What the situation uh, is like on the territories still controlled by Russian ter uh, terrorists and murders can hardly be estimated. What we will see on the territories uh, that were under occupation uh, for one and a half year or more, I am afraid we will be left speechless. The whole of humanity has plunged, plunged, plunged uh, into unprecedented insecurity due to the war of, aggr uh, uh, war of aggression committed by, by the country, which still occupies the permanent seats in the UN Security Council. Uh, the um, adverse impact of Russia's war on global food security, energy, nuclear security and safety, and the environment is felt far beyond Ukraine. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the of uh, President Zelensky's uh, Ukrainian peace formula is the restoration of justice. Uh, there can be no peace until justice has, has been served. Without justice, we will not be able to prevent the most terrible international crimes committed on the territory of my country in the future. As we all know, impunity is the greatest instigator of crime. With thousands of innocent Ukrainians <laughs> victimized by Russian aggressor, we have no moral rights to allow these crimes go unpunished. All the perpetrators must be brought to justice without exception. When we talk about individual accountability for international crimes, we refer to International Criminal Court. The ICC is conducting an investigation into the situation in Ukraine for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crime of genocide. The ICC recently produced a historic decision issuing arrest warrants for Putin and Russia's so-called uh, Commissioner for Children's Rights, Lvova Belova. This is the first step towards bringing the world's worst uh, war criminals and their accomplices to justice. However, this is not enough. We must all work together to ensure uh, accountability of the highest 
political and military leadership of the Russian Federation for committing the crime of aggression. Having caused the biggest war in Europe since World War II and led to committing of tens thousands of war crimes and crimes against humanity, uh, this uh, aggression must not go unpunished. We are all aware that the International Criminal, uh, criminal Court is unable to exercise its jurisdiction over the crime uh, of aggression against Ukraine. For this reason, we have proposed to our international partners the establishment of the special tribunal for the crime of aggression against Ukraine. And we are very grateful to Ireland for joining core group on options for uh, establishing this special tribunal uh, and uh, for its firm stance in shaping the thinking on ensuring criminal accountability for Russia's aggressions against Ukraine. And thank you, Council of Europe, for its leading role in the establishment of a register to record and document uh, evidence and claims of damage, loss, or injury <coughs> as the result of uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine. The register is uh, an integral part of current uh, international initiatives uh, to set up a compensation mechanism for Russia's, uh, Russia's cr uh, crimes aggression. Together, we must stop this war of aggression and terror. And the only one, the only way to prevent the Kremlin regime from, uh, regime from committing new crimes is to punish the existing criminals, to bring to account all those guilty uh, of, of crimes against Ukraine and Ukrainian people. We must also make Russia pay reparation for the damage and the injury caused by its criminal actions in violation of uh, international law. Many important steps have been made towards this goal, especially within the UN framework. And we are grateful to all our partners and relevant um, international institutions for their help and support. However, we must continue to consolidate our joint efforts to save Ukrainians and guarantee the protection of their rights and freedom. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And now with Ms. Sonia Highlands, Deputy Sec Gen and Political Director at the DFA, would like to come to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Larissa, I think these those har harrowing images that you have just shown us really serve as a very somber reminder of the really human cost um, of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. And I think sometimes when we look at the statistics, the number of people who have fled Ukraine, the number of people internally displaced in Ukraine, these are statistics in the millions and the tens of millions. Sometimes it's hard to take in that individual human cost. And I think um, what you showed us there is, is very important for that reason. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I think all of you here that we have tried uh, to be completely steadfast as a country in our support to Ukraine. And that has been since the earliest days of this illegal and unjustified invasion. And we have again tried to be also at the forefront of efforts to support Ukraine internationally and to oppose Russia's assault on international law. And one of the things that we're doing at the moment in the Department of Foreign Affairs this week is preparing for um, our uh, UN High Level Week, which is the week uh, where all of the heads of state and government and foreign ministers go to New York every year uh, at the UN. And it reminded me that this time last year we had just come back uh, when Minister Coveney was the foreign minister, we had just come back from Odessa. Um, and the reason we'd gone to Odessa at the time uh, was well, for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons was that Minister Coveney knew he would be speaking at the UN Security Council. We were on the Council, obviously, at the time uh, during High Level Week, and he wanted to see for himself and make sure that he had seen for himself what was happening in Odessa, the Black Sea Grain Initiative, how it was working, 
Uh, he did also the same, I think, uh, in, in his uh, visit to Bucha, to Kiev and to Bucha in April 2022. I think he was the first foreign minister to visit Kiev since the invasion, and again went then to the Security Council a few days later. And I think we felt and we still feel uh, at that time as a member of the UN Security Council, we were the only EU member state, elected EU member state on the council, and we felt a very strong responsibility to try and go and see for ourselves what was happening in Ukraine and then to go to the Security Council and bear witness to that and particular to, particularly to sit around the table of that council where Russia is also sitting and call out the disinformation and the lies that was coming that were coming from the Russian delegation um, on an individual basis and on a basis of having seen and having visited um, Ukraine. So again, we have we have tried to use we tried to use our our, our time on the Security Council, but now obviously uh, as a member of the General Assembly and at EU level, at the OSCE, at the Council of Europe, in all the various different multilateral organisations, we've consistently tried and used our voice to call on Russia to end its war, to comply with its obligations under international law, to withdraw all forces unconditionally from the internationally recognised territory of Ukraine, and I think one of the Things that I've heard about this conflict, which I think really resonates, is the phrase that um, if Russia stops fighting, the war ends. If Ukraine stops fighting, Ukraine ends. And I think this is something that we need to continue to repeat and continue to repeat, particularly, I think, to partners internationally who don't necessarily see it that way, who don't necessarily understand it that way, um, but that this is an existential uh, issue and an existential fight for Ukraine and that there is an aggressor uh, and a victim. We're not talking about an equal conflict where, where parties to the conflict have to, to come to the table uh, uh, on, a, on an equal basis, let's say. We also, as you know, uh, have welcomed over 91,000 Ukrainians to Ireland under the Temporary Protection Directive, and that's somewhere in the region now, almost of 2% of our, our total population. Um, Ireland also, as you know, has provided significant bilateral financial support to Ukraine, about 190 million since the war began, about 68 million in humanitarian development stabilization support, and about 122 million in non-lethal military assistance through the European Peace Facility. And again, just last week, the week before last, um, the Thonishtu was part of discussions with EU foreign ministers and EU defence ministers on a significant increase of the European Peace Facility over the next number of years to make sure that, again, Europe and the European Union can maintain our support to Ukraine in uh, defending its, its sovereignty and its territorial integrity. And that's a really essential thing that we continued that support. We've seen ongoing Russian attacks on civilians and on civilian infrastructure. We've seen that the sole purpose of these attacks is to terrorize the civilian population, to destroy Ukraine's economy, to destroy their natural resources, um, to try and change borders by force, uh, trample on the rules-based international order that we all rely on for our security and for our prosperity. And one of the things that when we talk to partners in the global south, I don't like the phrase global south, but I'll just use it as a shortcut that we say is that this is a, you know, this is a colonial power trying to eliminate its former colony. You know, we, we were we were we were a colony ourselves. We recognize this sort of behavior when we see it. And again, we try and talk with African, with Latin American and with other partners in that way and, and explain and talk about the fact that we don't care about this because it's Europe, we don't care about this because the victims are white, which you also sometimes hear, we care about this because this is a blatant violation of international law. And if people can do this, if we can change, if, if, if the strong can change borders by force in Europe, they can do it anywhere. And all of us, and particularly smaller countries like Ireland and like so many of our Global South partners need to care about this deeply for that reason and for other reasons, of course, as well. And I also want to just maybe repeat something that the Taoiseach and the Thonishta and the government in general has said many, many times, which is that we are a militarily neutral country, but we are not a politically or a morally neutral country. And when we see the sort of violations of international law, when we see the commission of international crimes, we will speak out and we will do everything that we can uh, and use our voice in every possible way that we can uh, to call that out and also to try and um, support its end. And our position is informed by the principles that drive Irish foreign policy and that have driven Irish foreign policy for decades. Support for human rights, for international humanitarian law, for the UN Charter and for a rules-based international order. And again, this is something that we say consistently to partners who don't necessarily share our views on Ukraine, that this is 
an international uh, and a principles-based approach that is not specific because it's a European country, not specific because it's happening on our continent only, but because this is an international uh, atrocity. This is an international outrage, and these atrocities uh, need to outrage us, us all. Larissa, you said already uh, we can't allow crimes to go unpunished. It's not enough to speak out, to, to, to be horrified. We have to do something practical and specific about it. And we have a whole um, set, and Declan Smith, my colleague, uh, our legal advisor, will talk in much more detail. We have a whole set of international uh, mechanisms that we can utilize to ensure accountability. And again, there are rules. Even in war, there are rules. That's what the Geneva Conventions are about. And when those rules are broken, there has to be accountability. And again, I know that that's what this discussion today will, will be about. And I know that uh, my colleague Declan will speak in much more detail about the sorts of issues and the sorts of actions that we're taking in multiple different fora to try and ensure accountability. Um, I'm really pleased again to, to, to be here, to be able to partner with the IIEA, with the Ukrainian Embassy, with the US Embassy and with Ukrainian Action in Ireland uh, to convene today's important event. When Larissa uh, came, came to us with the idea, we, we wanted to support it, it straight away. And again, just having those detailed panel discussions and really understanding what the options are, how we can take accountability forward is so important. <laughs> And again, I think just to say that the, the images that we've seen uh, here, but also I think the fact that we have 91,000 Ukrainians living in Ireland and each person, each individual person has uh, a difficult and, a, and often a horrifying story to tell, I think is something that is, is important to remember that who we are looking for accountability for, we're looking for accountability for individuals whose lives have been absolutely shattered through absolutely no fault of their own. And we're looking for accountability because we have a, a country on the Security Council, as you say, which has completely uh, rode roughshod uh, over the international rules that keep all of us safe. Um, and if none, if, if, if one of us are not safe, um, then none of us are safe. And that's why I think accountability is so important. And as you say, peace with justice uh, is so important. So again, thank you for the invite. Uh, thank you for uh, involving us in, in this um, seminar today. And just to say that again, uh, Larissa, we very much recognize and honor the huge sacrifices that the people of Ukraine are making. They are making that in their own, in the brave defense of their own freedom, uh, their own democratic choices, but also for all of us, and particularly I think for all of us in Europe. Uh, and again, to, to, to quote the Tonishta and the Tishik and many members of the government, uh, Ireland is very clear that we will continue to stand with Ukraine and the Ukrainian people for as long as it takes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Secretary General. So a final word of welcome uh, from Michael Klaus in the Charge of Affairs US mission in Ireland. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you. Kolehi, Druzi, Ta Inchi, Hosti, Dobarranku. Thank you, Ambassador Jarosko, Ambassador Highland, and IIEA for partnering to put this together today. This is a fantastic event. I'd like to echo Sonia's reaction to this sobering uh, photo exhibition from Bucha. Uh, these photographs depict the ongoing horror of Russia's unjust and unprovoked war, and they are a stark reminder that we must not allow ourselves to become complacent. Those responsible for these atrocities must pay a price for the horror and for undermining the principles that support international peace and security. As some of you in the audience know, uh, my wife and I were honored to serve at the American Embassy in Ukraine in the months leading up to Russia's full-scale invasion. The last photo that I took in Ukraine was much different than the ones you've seen today. It was my then seven-year-old son and his best friend drinking hot chocolate in the snow at their favorite playground in Kyiv. Just a few months later, Moscow hit that playground with a missile. Uh, while I know from firsthand experience, the resolve and resiliency of the Ukrainian people, it's also all too easy for me to imagine colleagues and friends as victims of Russia's actions. There is great value in these discussions, which serve to highlight Russia's ongoing brutality and bring together experts from Ukraine and from around the world to work towards our shared goal of justice for Ukraine and Ukrainians. The United States is proud to stand with Ireland in our support of uh, Ukraine as it protects its people and its freedom. Over the past month alone, we've welcomed nearly 30 members of Congress and other senior US officials to Ireland, all of whom have resolutely underscored continued support for Ukraine. Russia's forces committed and continue to commit war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine. 
let me be clear, these are part of a deliberate and orchestrated strategy of terror, attacks on civilians and children. And those who have committed these actions must be held accountable. I know that many of you are aware that the United States supports a range of international investigations and inquiries, including those conducted by the International Criminal Courts Prosecutor, the UN created International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine, the expert missions under the Moscow mechanism of the OSCE, and the investigations being conducted by Ukraine's Office of the Prosecutor General. The United States also continues to empower organizations to collect, preserve, and analyze open source, comprehensive information that can be used in national and international tribunes alike. For example, we funded the Yale Conflict Observatory, which is dedicated to documenting the war crimes, crimes against humanity, and other atrocities that have occurred and continue to occur in Ukraine. We believe that the main engine of accountability for the war in Ukraine will be Ukrainian courts themselves. So the United States has partnered with the EU and the UK to create the Atrocity Crimes Advocate Advisory Group to provide capacity building and technical assistance to Ukraine's Office of the Prosecutor General as it works to document, investigate, and prosecute over 100,000 war crimes identified so far. In closing, I want to thank all of you who have joined in person and online for your commitment to supporting Ukraine for your incredible generosity for those displaced by Russia and for contributing to this important discussion. A year after Russia's full-scale invasion, uh, President Putin's war on Ukraine continues to result in extraordinary costs. Thousands of civilians killed or wounded, thousands more forced into, <clears throat> subjected to forced deportation, sexual violence and torture, and millions forced to flee their homes and cities pounded to rubble. The United States and our partners will continue to stand with Ukraine and push for accountability and justice for as long as it takes. And we, along with our partners, will never allow the world to forget. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, speakers. We're on time, but I'm going to make haste because one of our speakers needs to depart. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite Declan Smith, legal advisor at the Department of Foreign Affairs, who will chair this session to come to the stage, uh, along with Professor Klaus Kress. In, uh, for the next couple of moments, um, our technical colleagues will be getting ready to uh, move into the next session. I'll just know there's a 15-minute break at the end of this session as well. So Declan, if you want to come to the stage, um, and Klaus as well. I'll just note as well that some of the participants are zooming in from very far away and given time zones, it's eating into family time and evening time. So it's very much appreciated, but nobody hesitated to participate once they were invited. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Declan Smith. Yes, yeah. Anton online. Anton is online. Okay, right, yeah. um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, there's been a slight change to the program. I, I was going to begin by making some introductory remarks about um, efforts that Ireland has made to date in attempting to ensure accountability for uh, Russian actions uh, in Ukraine. But one of our esteemed panelists, uh, Dr. Anton Koronevich, uh, who is currently in Kyiv, is shortly due to leave Kyiv uh, and uh, has to catch a train. So <laughs> we're going to proceed uh, straight away to hearing from Anton in Kyiv, and then I'll come back and we'll begin as we were. So perhaps, Anton, if you're online, uh, we can give you the floor now. Uh, thank you very much, dear Declan. Uh, I hope that the connection is stable and you can hear and, and see me. Uh, thank you very much to all the orga organizers for uh, making such a great event uh, in Ireland, in Dublin. Uh, it's a big pleasure and honor uh, to be part of this discussion. And uh, really, I appreciate the slight change of the program since, as of now, unfortunately, it takes at least 24 hours for us to get from Kyiv to any city in, in Europe uh, now with The Hague. Uh, before the full-scale invasion, we needed three hours with a plane. So unfortunately, this is also the result of this Russian full-scale invasion and something we here in Kyiv uh, need to tackle pretty much uh, every day. So uh, today's discussion is, of course, uh, one of the key uh, priorities for Ukraine uh, in working on international arena, in particular when we talk about the implementation of the uh, peace formula by the president of Ukraine, uh, His Excellency Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky. As the issue of accountability and justice, is uh, point seven of this peace formula. 
And here we talk about full and comprehensive accountability for all the atrocities, for all the violations of international law, which were, are, and will be committed by the Russian Federation as a state and by Russian citizens, Russian nationals in the territory of Ukraine. And it is a great honor and privilege for me to talk on such a great panel with, with, with you, Daklan, with Professor Kress, with Professor McDougall, who are world's leading experts on the issue which we're gonna discuss. So um, wh when we talk about this full and comprehensive accountability, first of all, we talk about the use of all the existing mechanisms and instruments and tools which make it possible for us to bring Russia as a state and Russian nationals to accountability. And I may assure you that as of now, since 2014, Ukraine actively uses each and every existing mechanism, instrument and tool to bring Russia and Russian citizens to account. Uh, we made applications, we, I mean Ukraine's government, to the International Court of Justice, to the European Court of Human Rights, to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, to the tribunals established under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. We recognize jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court and many, many more. So all the existing mechanisms and tools we use actively and effectively. And the reason why I'm leaving Kyiv now is that we are having a hearings in the International Court of Justice in The Hague starting soon against the Russian Federation, in our case on allegations of genocide. So uh, we use each and every tool which is possible for us now. But what do we see? We see that there are at least two important gaps, loopholes, in this accountability system which we need to fill in order for us to be able that we really applied and implemented full and comprehensive accountability. One of these loopholes is the issue of co uh, compensation mechanism. I'm sure that today you will have a conversation on that in particular with uh, participation of Her Excellency, Madam Minister Irina Mudra uh, from the Ministry of Justice of Ukraine. And another loophole is the one on which uh, we uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine and in other state organs of Ukraine work is the issue of accountability for the crime of aggression. We are sure that the, crime of, uh, that the crimes of aggression or crimes against peace, how they were labeled during the Nuremberg and Tokyo International Military Tribunals, are the reasons for all the other mass atrocity crimes, in particular war crimes and crimes against humanity, alert genocide committed on the territory of Ukraine. This is a very particular instance and example because there were armed conflicts in, in throughout the world when there was no crime of aggression, when there were non-international armed conflicts and war crimes were committed. But in the territory of Ukraine, our nation, my nation, my people, we didn't know what is a war crime before 2014, before the Russian aggression against Ukraine started. So that is why we consider that in order to fulfill this full comprehensive accountability, we really need to uh, ensure accountability for the crime of aggression against Ukraine. If it's not fulfilled, if it's not ensured, then we may say that we are unable to tackle the very reason, the very root cause of all the MS atrocity crimes committed on the territory of Ukraine. And we've been working on the issue of ensuring accountability for the crime of aggression against Ukraine for uh, almost a year and a half. We started this work in the end of February 2022 as uh, one of the reactions to the Russian aggression and full-scale invasion in the territory of Ukraine. And I must admit that at first, uh, from some of our international partners, we heard that uh, Ukraine should not try to invent something new. Ukraine should work uh, on the basis of existing mechanisms and tools and instruments. It will be enough. Uh, but now I think within this year and a half, the perception changed uh, crucially and highly. So as of now, we have national parliaments uh, which support the establishment of a tribunal which would have uh, jurisdiction for the prosecution of the crime of aggression against Ukraine. Um, as of now, we have a lot of resolutions of European Parliament, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, Parliamentary Assembly of NATO, Parliamentary Assembly of OSCE, which call the international community for the establishment of the special tribunal for the crime of aggression. As of now, we also have the establishment, and it is a common um, result of our work with our international partners, in particular with the EU, with Ireland, 
the establishment in The Hague of the International um, Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression Against Ukraine, ICPA. This is a very fresh, brand new center established in the beginning of July, which coordinates investigation uh, of the crime of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, and this investigation is done by Ukraine's prosecutors and prosecutors of foreign states. And just within nearest time, within nearest days, we'll be able to see in The Hague how this center really works. So we believe that with the establishment of the center, uh, we will have the establishment of the special tribunal uh, because, uh, as we understand, while we have investigation, we, of course, need to have prosecution and we need to have a court which will be able to um, adjudicate on the, on the issue and, and to prosecute for the crime of aggression against Ukraine. And this establishment of the center, ICPA, is itself a, a real historic moment, as Eurojust called this uh, moment, the uh, making history. Uh, as really this is the first international initiative uh, in prosecuting the crime of aggression after the Second World War, after Nuremberg and Tokyo International Military uh, Tribunals. What is also important, uh, we gathered a core group of states, which is a group of states represented by um, legal advisors from ministries of foreign affairs, which now uh, includes 38 states. And it's a pleasure and honor for us that Ireland is with us in this group. Uh, Declan participates actively in its work. And this core group is, is a legal uh, platform to discuss the issues of how the Special Tribunal for the Crime of Aggression uh, may be established, how to do this effectively, and how to actually make this happen. So we hope that uh, together with international partners, we will make the job done and we will establish the Special Tribunal. Um, on this way, one of the key and most important issue is the modality or the model for the establishment of the tribunal, uh, as it is obvious that for the uh, justice mechanism to be established, we need to choose the appropriate model, appropriate law, appropriate, I would say, way of establishing this tribunal. And as of now, there are two uh, main models or modalities which are being suggested by um, our international partners as, uh, as they consider them to be the most efficient, way, uh, efficient ones. The first one is the model of establishing the tribunal on the basis of Ukraine-UN agreement uh, with the uh, relevant resolutions of the United Nations General Assembly, which would uh, initiate and which would call the Secretary General of the UN to uh, have such an agreement with Ukraine. The other option, which is being also uh, supported by, by some of our international partners is the option of internationalized or hybrid tribunal, which gets its nature from Ukraine's national law, from Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's national legal and judicial system, uh, but which would have sufficient international elements, like, for instance, international judges, international prosecutors, relocation to, uh, to some European state and city, um, cooperation agreements with European states and international organizations, and so on and so forth. So as of now, the main discussions are between these two modalities and which modality may be uh, the most effective to get the job done. Uh, we in Kyiv consider that uh, the most effective would be the modality which would make the tribunal be able to uh, make effectively its job to prosecute the highest political and military leadership of the Russian Federation uh, mm -hmm. for committing the crime of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, and of course, it seems that the more international tribunal we would have, the more chances uh, it would have to uh, complete this task and to make this uh, job. But we continue to discuss these issues. We are sure that together with our friends and partners, both inside the core group and within our bilateral and multilateral consultations, we would find the most appropriate way to establish a special tribunal. Uh, my last point on this would be that we already in this year and a half made big intermediate interim um, progress uh, on the way to the special tribunal. Uh, we pretty much brought this issue, which has never been applied and implemented in international law since, 1950, since 1945, 1946, and now try to implement it to the new realities of Russia and Russian aggressive war against Ukraine. We are sure that we would make the job done, but of course for us, it is very important that this job 
has its result. So that the special tribunal is established and uh, it can work actively and effectively. We are also sure that without the special tribunal for the crime of aggression against Ukraine, which would again tackle this root cause, this primary crime, which caused all the other mass atrocity crimes committed on Ukrainian soil, uh, without the special tribunal, it would be a big damage for the foundational principle of international law of non-use of force and non-threat of force for the concept of the crime of aggression itself. And uh, if we do not succeed with special tribunal now, the concept of the crime of aggression may be left only for the students to teach within the course of history of international law, but not of its future. So I do believe that that is why we need to tackle this issue. We need to establish a special tribunal. And again, I'm sure that we would do that. Again, thank you so much to all the organizers uh, for this great event. Thank you to, to Declan. I'm sure that you would have wonderful discussion with Klaus and Kerry. So you're in very good hands and I wish you a fruitful and effective discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anton. And uh, I should say that as, as Anton mentioned uh, when he first embarked upon his his role as ambassador at large for the establishment of, of a special tribunal. He did meet, meet with quite a degree of skepticism, I think it's fair to say, from many of those he, he spoke to. And it's largely down to his own tireless efforts, really, that uh, this initiative has got so far. And I think that is, above all, a tribute to you, Anton, and the work you and your colleagues have done. So um, we are obviously doing all we can to help you in, in, in that regard. Um, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as I said earlier, we have a, a very eminent um, panel of speakers this afternoon on the topic of ensuring accountability for the crime of aggression against uh, Ukraine by means of a special tribunal. But, but before introducing uh, the panelists to you, uh, let me just say a few words briefly about the steps that Ireland has taken to date to try to ensure accountability of both the Russian Federation itself and of individual Russian officials and military personnel for breaches of international law and for the commission of international crimes in and against Ukraine. These steps in the legal field that have been taken are of course in addition to all of the other measures that Ireland has taken in, resp in response to Russia's uh, invasion, which Sonia has already mentioned continuing practical and financial assistance to Ukraine, imposition of sanctions on Russia and individual Russians, and of, of course, providing refuge to over 90,000 Ukrainian citizens who fled the war in such devastating circumstances. In the legal field, Ireland has made efforts to help ensure Russian account accountability in a number of different ways. Firstly, we were among the very first states to refer the situation in Ukraine to the International Criminal Court shortly after Russia's full-scale invasion began last year. This allowed the prosecutor of the court to immediately commence war crimes investigations in Ukraine in circumstances where, because Ukraine is not yet a party to the ICC statute, the prosecutor will otherwise have required the authorization of the court's pre-trial chamber. That authorization is a, a very complex and often lengthy process, and it would have considerably delayed commencement of investigations into war crimes in, in Ukraine. Secondly, Ireland has intervened as a, as a third party in Ukraine's case against uh, the Russian Federation under the Genocide Convention at the International Court of Justice, and has to date made a number of filings in that case. Uh, the court will next week hear oral argument from the parties on Russia's preliminary objections to the ICJ's jurisdiction in the case. Um, and Ireland will participate together with more than 30 other intervening states in those hearings at The Hague. And um, I hope to see Anton in The Hague uh, at those hearings next week. Ireland has also intervened in Ukraine's case against the Russian Federation taken at the European Court of Human Rights. As um, Anton mentioned, the Council of Europe has established a register of damage caused by the aggression of Russia against Ukraine. And Ireland is one of the founding participants, together with several EU member states, Canada, Japan, and the United States, 
in that register. The purpose of the register is to serve as a record in documentary form of evidence uh, and information on claims of damage, loss or injury caused by Russia's actions in or against Ukraine since February last year. It is intended that this register will be the first step towards the uh, towards creating an international compensation mechanism for victims of Russian aggression. And we'll hear more about that uh, on panel two this afternoon. On the question of aggression itself, which is the subject of this panel's discussion, Russia's invasion of Ukraine had no legal justification and therefore in legal terms amounts to an act of aggression. This was recognized almost straight away by the United Nations General Assembly uh, in a resolution adopted uh, shortly after the invasion began. International law prohibits all acts of aggression. Acts of aggression constitute violations of the victim state's sovereignty, its territorial integrity and political independence, all contrary to the United Nations Charter. Moreover, the crime of, in, of aggression is an international crime for which individuals may be held accountable and prosecuted before courts where they've been conferred with the necessary jurisdiction. Unlike war crimes, however, the crime of aggression is a leadership crime. Only those in a position effectively to exercise control over or to direct the political or military action of a state may be tried for aggression. The government of Ireland has recognized Russia's aggression against uh, that Russia's aggression against Ukraine represents perhaps the most serious challenge to the international legal order since the Second World War. The prohibition of aggression in international law has been an essential element of that order. And that is why the preservation and strengthening of the international legal order now requires an effective response from the community of states, in particular to ensure that there can be no impunity for aggression. Unfortunately, the ICC lacks jurisdiction in this very clear case of aggression because neither Ukraine nor Russia are parties to the court's statute. In these circumstances, other means of bringing to trial those responsible for Russian aggression must now be found. This essentially requires the establishment, as Anton has, has uh, already remarked upon, of a new special tribunal. What form a new tribunal should take has been the subject of intense discussion for the past 18 months. In particular, whether it should be either an international tribunal established within the framework of the United Nations or by way of multilateral treaty, or a hybrid internationalized tribunal based within the legal system of Ukraine. Each of the models considered raise difficult and challenging legal, political, and practical issues. Questions, for instance, of jurisdiction and reach, legitimacy, personal immunities, state, state cooperation with, with a new tribunal, and cost. And we will hear more on these issues this afternoon. Ukraine, as Anton has said, has established a core group on a special tribunal for the crime of aggression, of which Anton himself is the chair, and Ireland is an active participant in the work of the group. The group has grown since its first meeting earlier this year and now has uh, 38 members. Complementing the work of the core group is, as Anton also mentioned, the International Centre for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression in Ukraine, which was established by Eurojust in The Hague. And that centre will enable investigations into Russia's leadership to commence straight away while discussions continue on the creation of a special tribunal. The center in, began its initial operations, in fact, last July, and will be fully established by the end of the year. So I would like to now introduce our um, panel of uh, esteemed speakers. Um, and the first um, is uh, Professor Klaus Kress, who has joined us in person. Uh, Professor Kress is Professor of Public International Law and Criminal Law and Director of the Institute of International Peace and Security Law at the University of Cologne in Germany. His prior practice was in the German Federal Ministry of Justice on matters of criminal law and international law. In addition to his scholarly work, 
um, uh, which has been mostly on the law of the use of force, the law of armed conflict and international criminal law. Professor Kress has been a member of Germany's delegation in the negotiations on the International Criminal Court for many years, and since 2019 has served as a judge ad hoc on the, at the International Court of Justice in the case of the Gambia against Myanmar. We're also joined today by Zoom by Dr. Carrie McDougall, um, who is senior lecturer at the Melbourne Law School, University of Melbourne in Australia. Um, Dr. McDougall teaches and researches international law at the university there, specializing in the use ad bellum, international criminal law and international humanitarian law. She returned to academia after nearly a decade working for the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, where she served first as a legal specialist and assistant director of the international law section in Canberra, and then as legal advisor at Australia's mission to the United Nations in New York. She's currently one of a small group of experts advising the government of Ukraine on the prosecution of crimes uh, of aggression. And finally, we're joined uh, by Ms. Margarita Sniute Daugeliene. I'm sure I haven't pronounced that properly, but she is the vice president of Eurojust and was elected uh, to that position in June 2022. She began her legal career as a public prosecutor in the Regional Prosecutor's Office in Lithuania. Um, in 2016, she was appointed Deputy Prosecutor General, and during her professional career, she has participated as an expert in a number of projects relating to international cooperation and pr has, provided, has lectured on criminal law and international cooperation topics. Uh, she has also served as a contact point for the European Judicial Network between 2011 and 2017. So um, I'd like to call our first panelist um, to the podium, Professor Klaus Kress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Declan. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, especially Madam Ambassador from Ukraine and all Ukrainian friends. It's a great privilege and honor to be here today to address you on this crucially important topic. And perhaps you will allow me to begin my observations with one small word of tribute to somebody uh, we have all very much admired in the course of the negotiations on the crime of aggression in the ICC statute, Mr. James Kingston, who I understand was your predecessor, Declan. He was a central part of the family of negotiators, so to speak. And through him, Ireland had a very important voice in those and a principled voice in those negotiations. And so I thought, it was um, a good moment to um, remember him. He passed away so sadly. I wish to begin my remarks with three essential reasons why accountability in general is so crucial with respect to this egregious ongoing war of aggression. First of all, for the people, for each and every individual victim in Ukraine. Because this is the only way to give a minimum of recognition and satisfaction. This is one, and rightly so, one of the primary purposes of international criminal justice. The second reason is that I consider it important for the Russian society to face the truth, which is currently still clouded by powerful propaganda. And proper and fair judicial proceedings are a crucial means to make a society face the truth. I'm speaking here to you as a German citizen, so I'm not, even though I'm part of the, in comparison with with the horrible German past of a fairly young generation, I know how healthy and important it can be that a society in whose name 
horrors have been inflicted on the world are given the opportunity to face the truth through judicial proceedings. And the third reason has already given by my previous distinguished speakers. This is also about defending the international legal order. Russia's war of aggression is of course immediately against Ukraine and its people. But it is a terrible assault on the international order as a whole. And in particular on one of its cornerstones, as the ICJ has called it uh, in um, Congo versus Uganda, the cornerstone of the prohibition of force in the international relations. So for those three reasons, each of which would be sufficient, but for them in cumulation, it makes a powerful case for the need of accountability. And now moving to my second point, to comprehensive accountability. And comprehensive accountability goes beyond proceedings for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide those crimes under international law over which the ICC is currently in a position to exercise jurisdiction. And we have heard that those proceedings have resulted in a historic arrest warrant. But there is one, the fourth crime under international law, where Prosecutor Khan's hands are currently tied. Ambassador Kornievich has already mentioned one important argument why this constitutes a glaring gap in the current international legal architecture. Because President Putin's decision to initiate this war of aggression is, so to speak, the original sin, which has opened the floodgate to all the other horrible crimes that have ensued. This is one important reason. A second important reason is that those other crimes and proceedings for those other crimes, important as they are, I, has, I hasten to add, nobody would diminish the significance of proceedings before the International Criminal Court, before many national jurisdictions, including most importantly, of course, Ukraine's, but they are not capable of covering the entire injustice. Think of the killing on a daily basis of Ukrainian soldiers in the field, in the course of the battle. Each of you who has studied international humanitarian law knows this is no war crime. It cannot amount to crimes against humanity, genocide. But who would doubt that this is a serious, a deeply going injustice, every life lost of a Ukrainian soldier as a result of this aggression? Think of civilian casualties as a result of a military attack directed against a military object. I apologize, I have to be a little technical here. Not amounting to disproportionate to a disproportionate level under the existing law of armed conflict, not to be covered as a war crime, crime against humanity, genocide. Think of the huge destruction of property. Think of the huge environmental damage Ukraine is suffering. And think about how intensely high the threshold for war crimes is deplorably, one may say, under current international law of armed conflict. All this terrible injustice can only be properly accounted for if proceedings include this original sin, the crime of aggression. And thirdly, if we, coming back to this basic fact that it is the international legal order that is on assault and the cornerstone of this international legal order, the prohibition of the use of force. 
And if it is right, as I believe it, it is right. While this is unfortunately not the first violation of the prohibition of the use of force that we have been witnessing since the entry into force of the United Nations Charter, it is certainly the one with an unprecedented gravity. And if at this moment in time, the international community does not react with determination and does not make use of the core function of the international criminal justice system to prevent fundamental rules from erosion as a result of violation, then the future of the prohibition of the use of force is not a bright one. And this is, and now I'm coming to the third point, and this is why it is so important, irrespective um, of the um, crucial need for the continuation of all the endeavors at the national level and at the International Criminal Court, that something very specific and meaningful is being done when it comes to the crime of aggression. And that means under the circumstances, because all the other options which have been explored would not um, be able to cope with this lacuna in, uh, sufficient, in the sufficiently close future that a special tribunal for the crime of aggression must be established. And this is why, and it has been mentioned diplomatically after, for some observers, long months of delay, um, now uh, there is considerable uh, and very positive momentum. The fact that 38 states, Ireland included, my home country included, uh, are working hard on the establishment of such a tribunal is good news. Now on the format, I'm more than happy to go into any detail you wish um, at the Q&A session, but I have only limited time now. On the format, uh, Ambassador Konjevic has been duly diplomatic. Uh, I will be a little less, I will also be very diplomatic, but a little less, a little less diplomatic and will make it clear as a scholar, as an independent scholar, um, uh, what I believe the right choice should be between those, and he has said everything that must be said about those two formats which are currently in juxtaposition. I call it the international solution and the internationalized, but essentially Ukrainian solution. There is no doubt in my mind that the international model is the preferable one. Both from the perspective of what Ukraine needs, and therefore it is no secret that Ukraine favors the international solution, but also as a matter of what would serve the international legal order best. Because as you have said it a moment ago, Madam, this is not only in Ukraine's interest. We should all be grateful to Ukraine to have placed this item on the international agenda. The work of the special tribunal is a result of the fact which has now been recognized by many ceremonial statements of the European Union, the Council of Europe, that prosecutions for the crime of aggression are in the interest of the international community as a whole. This is what is written. And of course, the most natural translation of this consensus into institutional design would be to establish an international tribunal with the endorsement of the General Assembly speaking as one organ representing precisely this international community as a whole uh, and to establish a tribunal which would, in comparison with all the other options, the most qualified institution to speak in the name of the international community as a whole. No other court could do it in such a meaningful and powerful way. There are many other arguments, and I'm sure um, Professor McDougall will uh, add on. And just on the other side, there have been arguments, political, legal, you have mentioned them in general, 
but and I'm, I'm happy to go through them one by one. There is not one single political or legal argument that is compelling that would speak against the international model. It is ultimately a question of political will, of political determination to do what is best for the international legal order now. Um, and um, my preference in this regard is crystal clear. Let me finish with one sentence which goes slightly beyond the Ukrainian situation, but which takes up the, the call we have heard for principled action. And principled action would mean that we take as an international community the step we find the resolve which is necessary to meet the immediate needs of Ukraine, but always knowing that in international criminal justice, the most important currency is legitimacy. And this currency requires consistency and principled action. It is impossible to say with credibility we do it now in this case, but in the future we are happy to continue to live with this jurisdictional gap that we now all deplore. And therefore, we have to solve the problem at its root cause. And this is the jurisdiction, jurisdictional gap that we have in the ICC statute, which is not there, ladies and gentlemen, because of legal necessities. This is a result of political will of a minority of states in the course of the negotiations. And if we want to be principled, if we now understand that we are at a critical juncture and have to get serious against the crime of aggression, we have to close this gap in the ICC statute, which means, difficult as it is to initiate a process, a diplomatic process to improve, to reform the ICC statute. And I would argue it is for all those participating in this process now, a credibility test, whether they will also make the second step. And this is ultimately, Ambassador Kornievich has mentioned it. This is ultimately what US Chief Prosecutor Robert Jackson in Nuremberg promised the world when he stood up and said, if this is to have a practical meaning for the future, then this cannot, in Nuremberg, he said this, then this cannot remain an isolated case. Then this law must be applied in the future equally to everybody, including those sitting here in judgment. I have not probably cited it crystal clear word by word, but I think you got the essence. And that's the question we have to face now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Klaus, for those uh, fascinating comments. I'd like to now give the floor to Dr. Carrie McDougall, who's joining us from Melbourne. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Declan, and thank you to all of the hosts for the invitation to join this important discussion. Um, I've been told I have a maximum of seven minutes. In that time, I'm going to try to make seven key points. First, it's absolutely essential that states do everything possible to reinforce the prohibition of the use of force. As we've already heard, in the wake of Russia's aggression, the future of the international order is being decided. States might have varying views on what that future should look like, but all states have a fundamental interest in ensuring that the prohibition remains the keystone of the global order. Allowing those responsible for crimes of aggression to enjoy impunity will profoundly weaken the prohibition of the use of force, embolden Russia in Ukraine and beyond, and encourage imitation. Two, the prosecution of crimes of aggression is at this point, the most obvious way of reinforcing the prohibition. 
The international community has of course taken a number of steps to reinforce the prohibition by sanctioning Russia and supporting Ukraine. And we've heard some specific measures mentioned by our Irish and US colleagues already. But states haven't done everything they could. It's well understood why Ukraine's allies haven't intervened militarily in the conflict. The very fact, however, that direct military enforcement of the prohibition is off the table makes it all the more important to use all other available levers. The prosecution of crimes of aggression would be both low cost in all senses of the term and high impact insofar as it would make it crystal clear that manifest violations of the prohibition won't be tolerated. It would also ensure that those most responsible for the original and all encompassing wrong committed against Ukraine, which opened the door to the commission of so many other shocking crimes against the Ukrainian people are held to account. Three, an international tribunal would be better placed than a hybrid to reinforce the prohibition of the use of force and deliver justice to the people of Ukraine. An international tribunal would enjoy greater legitimacy than a hybrid in the eyes of the global community, which would minimize concerns about a lack of impartiality and enhance the tribunal's ability to secure voluntary cooperation and isolate persons against whom arrest warrants are issued. Any judgment delivered on behalf of the international community, not simply the Ukrainian state or any state to which Ukraine, Ukraine might transfer jurisdiction, would also ensure that the judgment's deterrent potential was maximised. Four, the UN Charter provides a legal basis for the establishment of an international tribunal. Articles 10, 11, 2 and 14 of the Charter empower the General Assembly to make recommendations in relation to matters within the scope of the Charter generally and in relation to the maintenance of international peace and security specifically. Those powers are sufficient for the Assembly to adopt a resolution requesting the Secretary General to negotiate an agreement on the establishment of a tribunal and a resolution approving such an agreement. Critically, the establishment of a tribunal does not require coercive powers, which are exclusively enjoyed by the Security Council, because the tribunal would be established with Ukraine's consent. Ukraine can provide the necessary consent because of the territorial jurisdiction that it uncontroversially enjoys over the crimes in question. Five, an international tribunal is the best way of ensuring that those responsible won't be able to hide behind immunities. Now, of course, some states and scholars maintain a different view. But it's difficult to ignore the well, now well-established line of jurisprudence holding that immunities don't apply before an international tribunal. It's been argued that this is moot because the Troika could realistically only ever be prosecuted after they leave office and lose immunity. However, this ignores the fact that in line with the ICJ's decision in the arrest warrant case, a hybrid tribunal would be unable to even issue an arrest warrant against immunity holders. This would significantly detract from the expressive value of the tribunal and its ability to isolate Putin and his cronies. The argument also assumes that functional immunity wouldn't apply. However, while the International Law Commission has suggested that there's an exception to functional immunity, for serious international crimes, it didn't extend that exception to the crime of aggression. To date, state reactions to the ILC's position have been mixed. As such, there's a real possibility that a hybrid tribunal could conclude that it's unable to exercise jurisdiction over any current or former state official. Six, the rationale for a hybrid tribunal is lacking. In the past, hybrid tribunals have been created when it was necessary to create a domestic mechanism to support an international tribunal or where there was a need for local ownership. 
Those rationales don't exist in the current context. Ukraine has expressed a clear preference for an international tribunal. There's also no need for the tribunal to have jurisdiction over any separate domestic offences. While Article 437 of Ukraine's criminal code criminalises aggression, its definition doesn't include a leadership qualifier. And it seems to be widely agreed that the statute of any tribunal should use the definition found in Article 8 bis of the Rome Statute rather than the Ukrainian version of the crime. Seven, and I offer this final point respectfully, I'm fearful that states are self-harming their own fundamental interests by turning a blind eye to the consequences of double standards. To make this point, I must be a little less diplomatic than Anton and Klaus, and in my personal capacity, call out the elephant in the room. I think it's obvious that the main driver behind support for the hybrid model is a fear that a GA-based international tribunal could create a precedent that may not be in the interest of certain states. I did my PhD on the crime of aggression. I was actively involved in the special working group on the crime of aggression, the Rome Statute Review Conference, and the negotiations on the activation of the ICC's jurisdiction over the crime. When I was an Australian government legal advisor, I worked with our closest allies in relation to a range of international military operations. In other words, I'm no stranger to the sensitivities that surround the crime of aggression. However, the risk of the GA establishing another tribunal to prosecute any future military action of a state that it has at least a defensible legal basis is, in my assessment, negligible. Such action wouldn't meet the high threshold built into the definition of the crime of aggression, and in those circumstances, a proposed tribunal wouldn't command the support of a majority in the GA. Moreover, whether you think it's justified or not, the undeniable fact is that the narrative that many Western states apply a double standard when it comes to the use of force and to international criminal justice has taken a firm hold in many parts of the globe. Because of this, those states that played a key role in shaping the current international order and which have benefited enormously from it are losing their moral authority and thus their ability to command support for the international rules-based order. The surest way to address this is to demonstrate a willingness to hold oneself to the same standards as every other member of the international community. That can be achieved by supporting the establishment of an international tribunal, as well as ratifying the Rome Statute and the Aggression Amendments, and supporting the removal of the restrictions on the ICC's jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie, for those thought-provoking comments. Um, our final speaker this afternoon on this uh, Margarita Sniute Daugel Liene, um, who is the Vice President of Eurojust. Margarita, you have the floor now. Thank you very much, David Atlan. I hope you can hear me. Yes? Uh, Your Excellencies, dear participants, uh, first of all, let me thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to contribute to today's important event. And indeed, congratulations to the organizers on having put uh, together such an interesting uh, program. A discussion about a possible tribunal for the prosecution of the crime of aggression um, against Ukraine is both relevant and uh, timely. But before touching upon your just role uh, concerning the investigation of the crime of aggression, I would like to briefly set the scene. Only three weeks after the start of the war, you just helped to set up a joint investigation team, or JIT in short, as we say. 
Initially composed of Ukraine, Lithuania, and Poland, this uh, joint investigation team now also includes the membership of Latvia, Estonia, Slovakia, and Romania. For the first time uh, ever, the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court participates in, in EGIT, and the EGIT members have also signed a memorandum of understanding with the United States. The benefits of working together in a joint investigation team are clear. It enables close cooperation between all parties involved and an effective and fast exchange of information and evidence without the need for uh, traditional letters of request. JIT partners can also count on Eurojust financial, legal, operational, and logistical support. This JIT is focused on the investigation of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide in the context of the war in Ukraine. All those involved parties and JIT countries agreed that the fight against impunity cannot exclude the violation of one of the cornerstone of the modern international rule-based order, the prohibition of the use of force. Of force. That is why the crime of, uh, of aggression is being investigated within the, the JIT as well. And for this reason, Eurojust launched an international center for the prosecution of the crime of aggression, or ICPA, on the 3rd of July of this year. The key purpose of the ICPA is to secure crucial evidence and facilitate the process of case building at an early stage. As such, the ICPA represents an important next step in our collective efforts to end impunity at all levels. Representatives from national authorities that have joined the ICPA are hosted at Eurojust premises in The Hague, where they benefit from tailor-made support from Eurojust side and our newly set up co-international crimes evidence database. In addition to Ukraine, five other JIT countries, that is Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, and Romania, as well as the United States, are currently participating in the ICPA. However, the ICPA is potentially broader in scope than the joint investigation team. Other countries in possession of relevant information or evidence may also request their participation in ICPA. What the ICPA does not do is anticipate a specific outcome of the political debate on the setting up of a dedicated tribunal. As you know, an important, an important part of this debate takes place in uh, the realm of the so-called uh, core group, which was mentioned, joined by 38 countries from different continents. And as you know, that they will have the next meeting next week on the 22nd of September. While Eurojust closely follows the discussions, we refrain from taking a position on what should be the way forward. In the end, the decision to set up a tribunal will be taken uh, at the heads of state and government level. And it's clear that each option has advantages and disadvantages. The ICPA's working methods are also, also reflect that there is no final decision on a tribunal yet. For example, evidence and other relevant documents will be translated both into Ukrainian and English to ensure that they can be used before different national jurisdictions as well as international courts. So for now, Eurojust priority is making sure that no time is lost in building a case for the future prosecution uh, for the crime of aggression, whatever that prosecution will take place. Through this pragmatic approach, we hope to make an important contribution to collective accountability efforts. So with this, I would like to conclude my brief intervention and I'll be happy to answer questions if you may have. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Margarita. Uh, we've now reached the stage of, of the panel discussion where the um, 
uh, the panelists, I mean, the, the discussion is opened to the wider audience. Um, I'm also going to perhaps before beginning with that, um, invite the panelists to uh, perhaps consider the remarks of, of each other. Margarita mentioned um, just now that the ICPA will uh, collect evidence which can in due course be presented to a tribunal um, once such a new special tribunal has been established or without any regard to the nature or and identity of that future tribunal. One of the ideas uh, that has been suggested for um, an appropriate tribunal is um, either instead of or in parallel to work on creating a special tribunal to amend the statute of the International Criminal Court to extend its jurisdiction over the crime of aggression um, so that it would cover this particular case of aggression. Um, could I ask maybe um, you, Klaus, and, and, and Carrie, um, what are your views on the proposals to amend the Rome Statute? Do you think, for instance, that they may detract or divert resources from efforts currently underway to establish a special tribunal or are worth pursuing uh, in parallel? Uh, can I start with you, Carrie? Uh, uh, thanks, Declan. Um, and I, I'm sure Klaus will be able to add to this as well, but my very firm view is that it is initiative that should be, in fact, pursued in parallel with efforts to establish a special tribunal. Um, as Klaus explained, um, this is about plugging uh, that jurisdictional gap, which is forcing us to look for an ad hoc tribunal in order to hold those responsible for crimes of aggression against Ukraine to account. And it is um, the best way of ensuring that we both don't face this uh, situation in the future and that um, as many states as possible are held um, to the same standard in relation to the crime of aggression. Um, perhaps I could uh, quickly uh, provide advice um, that uh, just recently, um, I have actually uh, drafted in consultation with other aggression experts, including my good friend and, and colleague, uh, Klaus Kress, um, some proposed model amendments that have been uh, promoted or published by the Global Institute for the Prevention of Aggression. Um, they would you know, be very much aimed at bringing the jurisdiction of the ICC um, over the crime of aggression into line with the court's jurisdiction with the other crimes included in that 1998 version of the statute. So I'd recommend those to audience members. Thanks very much, um, Gary, for that. Uh, Klaus, would you like to say something uh, about, um, about this question too? Just a few sentences as I essentially agree with uh, what Kerry has said. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that the best solution, if one could paint an ideal legal world, um, would be that the ICC was now in a position to conduct investigations also over the crime of aggression. I believe the International Criminal Court is the most legitimate international judicial institution we have for the exercise of criminal justice, precisely because uh, it is um, an institution with credible universal orientation, open for every state um, which is part of the international community uh, to join every day with an open-ended jurisdiction. So it is the best approximation that we currently have to the idea uh, to the fundamental principle of justice, equality before the law. Um, I would go one step further. This is not entirely uh, uncontroversial as I see it, but uh, here again, it is my view uh, that legally speaking, it would be possible to amend the ICC statute and to make this amendment applicable also to the situation of Ukraine. And it would not be in... Uh, it would not violate the principle of retroactivity because it would be about jurisdiction. The substantive crime undoubtedly was there uh, when the aggression against Ukraine began. But here it is ultimately a political choice to see how long would such a diplomatic process take 
in order to, to amend the ICC statute. And here, um, I think scholars should be humble and defer uh, to the judgment um, of political decision makers. And it has become fairly clear uh, in the international conversation that even those many uh, actors who are in favor of amending the ICC statute, they realistically say this is it will likely be a complicated process. There are a number of tricky legal issues uh, to be discussed. It should be done properly. Anything that is done about the ICC statute should not be done in a rush because it's meant to last uh, for the decades to come. And it will not be uh, happening uh, in the time Ukraine needs it. And this is something um, as a scholar, I of course accept. So that political choice to me seems to have been done. This is why 38 states uh, are now uh, engaged in this process in the core group. Those states are not against the amendment idea. They just take this pragmatic choice that under the circumstances, that's the best way forward. But, and that's the essential point Kerry made, and I want to make it again, there is no reason now to delay the initiation of such an amendment process for two reasons. First of all, and as we both said, it will be a fairly lengthy one. So no reason to waste time here. Everybody should now know how important the question is. And we want to avoid having to face a jurisdictional gap once again. Uh, so um, that's one reason. And second, because this conveys the credible message of all those involved now in the conversation about a special tribunal, that they really mean it not just for this, of course, egregious case that gives us now reason um, to get more serious against the crime of aggression than before, but also for the future. It is a critical uh, moment in time for Ukraine, but also for being principled when it comes to international criminal justice. Thank you very much. Um, one of the issues um, that has been raised by a number of, of, of our panelists um, in relation to the establishment of a, of a new special tribunal is the question of immunities. And you will have heard um, uh, this topic referred to on a number of occasions, uh, in particular, the difference between functional and personal immunities. Harry, could I ask you maybe for the benefit of our audience to explain the difference between the two? And then maybe uh, each of you could say to what extent you think the issue of immunities is, uh, is, is a hurdle to the establishment of a, of a new special tribunal. Thanks, Declan. I'll, I'll try and keep my uh, remarks brief because uh, class is a well, well uh, recognized expert on, on the question of immunity, so I would defer to him. But uh, very briefly, personal immunity is immunity um, enjoyed by just, or well, we think just three individuals, it's not entirely settled, but certainly head of state, head of government, foreign minister uh, during their time in office, which is essentially a blanket immunity. It prevents those individuals um, from being prosecuted before a foreign domestic court for any civil or criminal uh, allegation, at both before their time in office and during their time in office. Um, once those individuals leave office, uh, the ICJ has uh, told us in the arrest warrants case, they can be uh, prosecuted for personal acts uh, committed during their time in office. Um, but the suggestion is not for uh, official state acts. But of course, the unanswered question from the arrest warrants case is whether a serious international crime can properly be considered an official um, act. Now, there's probably an arguable case if you're talking about uh, crime against humanity, perhaps genocide. It's very difficult, I think, to make that claim if you're talking about a state act of aggression <laughs> um, that, by definition, um, has to be orchestrated by someone who is leading the political and military action of a state. Uh, functional immunity is, a, is an immunity that is enduring. It's not dependent on an individual's term in office and applies to all official state acts. And as I mentioned briefly in my presentation, um, the exact status of functional immunity and its applicability in relation to serious international crimes 
is somewhat unsettled. Um, there, you know, different examples of state practice and opinio juris on the record. Um, the last point I would make very quickly is that I think it's actually, you know, absolutely imperative from a Ukrainian point of view that those individuals in leadership positions, principally President Putin, not be able to escape justice by relying on an immunity. And so I think there's a very good reason this subject has occupied such a significant place in the discussions about the tribunal model, um, because as I indicated, there's a, a line of jurisprudence that tells us that immunity doesn't apply before in at least certain international tribunals. Um, and there's, a, I think, a very real risk that immunities could be successfully relied upon by a hybrid tribunal that is structurally part of the domestic uh, legal system of a state and where that hybrid tribunal is not an international organisation and doesn't enjoy international legal personality. Thank you, Carrie. Klaus, would you like to say something about the extent to which you think immunities would, would affect this? Also just a few sentences in addition to agree to what Carrie said. Let me start the other way around. Let me start with functional immunities and with the absence of the crime of aggression from the current list of draft, draft Article 7. This, of course, if judges of an internationalized Ukrainian tribunal would guide themselves or would allow themselves to be guided uh, by the current list of draft Article 7, the result would be a disaster for uh, those proceedings. Because as, as Kerry said, functional immunity would apply to each and every suspect by definition. You cannot imagine uh, a person not acting in official capacity being among the suspects. So one first key message is to all those who are currently supporting the Ukrainian internationalized solution, we are now um, in preparation of the second reading within the ILC, the second reading of draft Article 7. All states have been invited, the deadline is 1st December this year, to provide their comments on draft Article 7. One would expect that especially those states who support the internationalized Ukrainian model would come forward and uh, tell the ILC that they think that draft Article 7 should include the crime of aggression. Otherwise, it is very, very difficult to find that position internally coherent. On the one hand, to suggest an internationalized Ukrainian tribunal, and on the other hand, to maintain functional immunity for the crime of aggression. This is, I put it very diplomatically, um, a problematic position to take. Second point on um, uh, the question of personal immunities. Obviously, it is one important reason for Ukraine to prefer the international model. And now again, I formulate it very cautiously because the chances in light of the current state of the case law, the international case law, the chances that personal immunity will not apply before an international tribunal are significantly higher than before a Ukrainian internationalized tribunal. Kerry has very fairly, uh, and I shall, so, uh, shall do the same, said the issue of personal immunities, even before an international tribunal, remains a matter of some controversy. It would be dishonest to say that uh, there is uh, agreement among the scholarly community as such, uh, for example. However, with the arrest warrant against President Putin, it has been crystal clear, it should have become crystal clear, even to the last reader who doubted that the appeals chamber had said the same in the Al-Bashir case, that the ICC believes, and I think rightly so, that under customary international law, there are no personal immunities applying in proceedings before it. There have been also scholarly colleagues who have tried to water down the Al-Bashir precedent by saying, well, there was a Security Council resolution. 
but they, they have not closely read the judgment. The judgment made it very clear that they did not rely exclusively on the Security Council referral in, for, in terms of Security Council Resolution 59.3. The judgment is crystal clear that the basis was customary international law. So to a close reader of the judgment, what happened now uh, with Putin's arrest warrant in the absence of a Security Council resolution could come as no surprise. The court is simply doing what the appeals chamber said in al-Bashir. Now, is there a reason, this is something that is sometimes heard, is there a reason from the perspective of personal immunities to distinguish between the ICC on the one hand and an international tribunal established accordance, in accordance with the preference of Ukraine by treaty uh, between the United Nations and Ukraine? My answer to this is clearly no. Nothing in the line of precedents which are applicable, starting with Sierra Leone, then coming to the al-Bashir case in, um, in the ICC, and on a close reading, you can even include the Milosevic case of the ICTY, nothing in the relevant judgments suggests that there is a distinctive feature between the ICC as an international court uh, and an international court established by a treaty between the United Nations, not just two states, between the United Nations and Ukraine. So um, it is very understandable that Ukraine is confident that personal immunities would not apply. Last observation. Let us assume for a moment the judges would decide differently. And of course, ultimately, we should wait and see what the judge, it will be for the judges to decide. It's for the judges to apply existing customer international law. But the point is, would it be an obstacle to the, would it be an argument against the international solution that there is a possibility that the judges decide differently? Certainly not. There is just a risk, as you always have it, that perhaps the, the judgment will be different from the solution that you desire. But the point remains, the international tribunal would do its work and the chances before an international tribunal are certainly better than before a national one. Okay, thank you for that, Klaus. Margarita, can I ask you, uh, has the ICPA or your just uh, joint investigation team anticipated any, any uh, difficulties in, in um, your activities raised by the question of immunities? Thank you very much, dear Declan. Indeed, uh, this uh, um, personal immunities, uh, immunities aspect for the prosecutors working on the crime of aggression is very important, and uh, they discuss discussing discuss this uh, these things. But uh, of course, uh, for for now, they they are more focused, as I mentioned, for for secure crucial evidence and facilitating uh, the process of of the case building. You know. But it's it's this aspect is is being discussed and and very important for these uh, prosecutors. But I absolutely agree with what what uh, the panelists uh, panelists uh, discussed and uh, nothing to add in terms of of the content. Thank you for that. Um, we're we're now going to open the the floor for discussion. And uh, so before I'm um, asking uh, you to. To pose your questions, I just want to ask those who are asked to ask a question to identify themselves in any affiliation they may have. And I ask the gentleman in the second row here um, in the cream jacket. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Ronan Tynan, uh, first of all, I just want to commend everybody involved for organizing this very important seminar, especially the Ukrainian ambassador and the Institute, because I believe anything that raises the profile of accountability advances accountability and hopefully nurtures outrage and international crimes. My name is Ronan Tynan, and the, the designation I have that's relevant to the question I'm about to ask is because I directed a documentary called Bringing Assad to Justice. We looked at serious crimes in Syria. And of course, since the Ukraine war, it's been very painful because we also showed Russian crimes in Syria, even Russian pilots receiving coordinates of hospitals before they bombed them, coordinates they received from the United Nations to avoid those hospitals and then use them as a target list. So really what I want to put to the panel, and it's extremely important, I would suggest, even in the debate around a special tribunal for accountability, 
If we allow this ad a la carte attitude to addressing horrific crimes internationally, surely we make it easy for politicians and officials to adopt a pragmatic and inverted commas line that unless we're prepared to recognize Russia in particular is a serial offender and is actually repeating the very same crimes it committed in, in Syria. And indeed, in one of the groups we uh, investigated and featured, they have now over a million pages of evidence, even documents with a sad signature on them, uh, confirming alleged involvement in serious international crimes. And Putin's commanders in Ukraine, for example, have been had earned uh, designations like the Butcher of Aleppo, when they were appointed in Ukraine, many people suddenly discovered they had a career in Syria. So I'm just suggesting this uh, compartmentalization of uh, in addressing horror is an indictment of all of us. And in the context of Ukraine, we have an opportunity to break out of that. And I'd be most interested in the uh, response from the panelists to that uh, question. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I might take two or three questions in, in one go. So I'd ask Pat Cox at the back there. Very briefly, a wonderful session. Thank you very much. I'm Pat Cox, former president of the European Parliament. I'll say in that in this context, in 2000, 2003, 2004, I was president of the parliament before the war started in Iraq. I went to Washington, D.C. I had in my speaking notes the Rome Statute and the ICC. I met in the East Wing with Dick Cheney and with Condoleezza Rice, and particularly with Condoleezza Rice, who was more open in all of this. She said to me, look, here's the reality. A guy like you is most unlikely ever to be hauled before the ICC. Someone who's head of the National Security Council of the United States could end up in that position. We prefer to submit ourselves to our own law. And I make a general observation from that because I, I find your case compelling about the need to avoid double standards for equality before the law for all states. In the real politic, as I met it at that time and that I've seen since, the states that I would call the Gullivers in our world see these law for the people of Lilliput, but that the Gullivers are different as Leviathans beyond that law. So your case is compelling. And my question is, do you think the real politic is there to deliver on the compelling logic you've spoken to? Thank you for that. We will take maybe just one final question before we go to the panel. A gentleman uh, just behind you, sir. Hi, thank you. My name's Owen Duggan. I'm currently serving in Ireland's embassy to Ukraine. Um, and my question is perhaps related to that by, by pa, the point made by Pat Cox. Uh, Clice, you made a very uh, compelling point that in international law, the currency is legitimacy. And if the international model is pursued, and I would agree it's, it's a very compelling case you make, what does legitimacy look like? Because if it is something that is established um, in the General Assembly of the UN, asking the UN Secretary General to, to establish such a mechanism, what is required? What kind of support is required? Um, does it have to be everybody there? Because everybody won't vote for that. So what levels of votes are we talking about? Or do we measure it by the, the strength of the resolution that, you know, it has a minority of support, a huge amount of abstentions, but it is a, it is a very strong mechanism. I'd just be fascinated by, by uh, the full panel's thoughts on that. Yeah, well, thanks very much. Klaus, would you like to, be, to begin um, some thoughts on those questions? And yeah. then I'll go to the panel on the screen. If that's fine for Kerry, I will, yes. Um, perhaps I take it in the, inverse order because um, your question sir was very um so all three questions fascinate but yours was the most uh, concrete one um on the majority requirements but let me get, uh, get one step back first legitimacy and general assembly why is that directly connected first of all because the general assembly in the absence of an active security council obviously under blockade the general assembly is that body that institutional representation of the international community as a whole that is currently the best available to act so the closest one to speak for the international community as a whole second point you cannot simply go before the general 
assembly ask for the necessary majority and get it. In this process, you will receive questions. Questions from, we have referred to the, in inverted comma, global south, many states which are perhaps a little bit more distant um, uh, to the events than we are here. And those delegations in New York, I don't think they are neg uh, necessarily negative to the idea. But one question they will ask is, are you prepared to do what you ask us to support now in similar cases in the future? And that's, it. that's the core legitimacy question. And I think we should not criticize delegations to ask that question. We should give a convincing answer. And this convincing answer should be, and that's the best we can do at this moment in, in time, to a pledge that this is not the end of the matter here, but at the same time, we are initiating a process to avoid in the future the need to return to the General Assembly each step and to have this compartmentalized approach. We have to move step by step beyond <laughs> compartmentalization. So this is why I see the move to the General Assembly, which is of course by no means a given that it will be successful, but the need to try this as hard as we can this also involves, in my view, the need to explain that we mean it in a principled manner. So third question, um, technically speaking, what will be the um, majority? There is, as I see it, a degree uh, of uncertainty and perhaps even controversy. One thing is clear, having a two-third majority uh, would be the safest basis. But I believe there is a, a strong case under the, the institutional law of the United Nations, uh, under the relevant article, if this question is considered to be one of great importance, which I think obviously it is, that a simple majority uh, could apply. In the end, it would be a formal, the, the question of majority does not count population numbers. And so it's a formal requirement under the charter. And I think we should accept that that majority requirement that is in the end applicable, my inclination would be simple majority suffices, that this is the agreement of the international community to have its organ, the General Assembly, speak for it. It should apply now as it should apply in other cases. So that would be um, my attempt to, to answer your question, sir. Let me first, um, sir, make one um, uh, express one word of gratitude to um, parliamentary assemblies uh, in this process. We have heard from the ambassador that when it all started, and by start, I do not mean the start, the original start of the aggression in 2014, but the start of the outright full-scale war, war of aggression, governments have been fairly silent for a while, for many months as I said, far too long for my taste. That this has changed has a lot to do with principled articulation of many parliamentary bodies. And I stress this, not just in Europe. Global pa uh, parliamentarians for global action, and I have been to Buenos Aires and have seen those deputies from all over the world debating about this question have been uh, very powerful. The European Parliament, of whom you have been a, uh, an outstanding member, and I wish as we benefit of the um, presence of a representative of the Council of Europe, I wish to stress that in my humble view, the best, the most articulate, the most principled resolution calling for an international tribunal, calling for an amendment of the ICC statute at the same time, uh, has been adopted by the Council of Europe um, in the form of resolution. You know well better. You will know better. Two four eight three, uh, I think. So that is really an important point of reference. And now moving from there to to your key points, sir. Uh, um, international law is, uh, or at least international criminal justice here uh, is for the Lilliputs, and not for the Gullivers. So. Um, don't uh, believe that because you are speaking to a professor of law, 
that you are confronted with 110% naivete. I have been uh, part of the negotiation process as member of my delegation for more than 25 years. I have seen each and every move in those debates. I think I have a reasonably realistic uh, view of how difficult it is to convince Gullivers, how difficult it is to make steps forward, to what extent those steps are smaller and slower in pace as one would wish them to have. But on the other hand, I wish to tell you, looking back 25 years, and looking back to the point where we started at the Rome conference, when we had to struggle to get the crime of aggression into the statute at all, it was a last night compromise, 17 July, the night from 17 to 18 July, that the crime of aggression was at all included. And then again, many Gullivers smiled gently and said, forget it. It's a placeholder, nothing would happen. And you know what happened? A Lilliput, Liechtenstein, and uh, my friends in Liechtenstein will forgive me, Lilliput in military power, but Gullivers in brain, they, they took the lead and they managed to create such a powerful diplomatic momentum that at the end, even Gullivers could not completely ignore it. And we made another step first in Kampala 2010, then in New York 2017. Each time it was a nightly affair um, and disputed, yes, disputed, that's part of the truth, by Gullivers until the very end, but in the end we made that step. Now we realize this step was still insufficient. We need another one, but this is what we have been witnessing, experiencing in the history of international criminal justice all the time. We come to moments of great crisis, critical junctures, and only then the world is prepared to make the, step, the next step. Sir, that the United States, we have heard it from uh, its representative today, that the United States are now supporting the work of the International Criminal Court in the situation of Ukraine is a major development. If you consider that of course those investigations are chiefly directed against non-state party nationals. And you will remember the, the, the court exercising jurisdiction about non-state party members is the main reason, the main bone of contention of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the ICC. So if the United States now see the value of the International Criminal Court at this moment in time, one would hope I'm not sure whether a representative is still here, but I would um, say it very openly. One would hope that the United States will take the position that they have taken now consistently and also apply it to themselves. And this is how we uh, move on step by step. Um, you, may, you may call it naive. I would call it um, cautiously optimistic. And the last point. No, no, ah, okay. No, no. Um, yeah. Just maybe bring Carrie and Margarita in at this point. Margarita, would you like to, do you have any comments on any of those questions? Just a very brief comment related to the first question from my side and uh, the end of uh, my, my intervention on a positive uh, note. Uh, while the focus now is on, on uh, the war in Ukraine, our new co-international crimes evidence database at Eurojust allow us to store, preserve, and analyze evidence related to co-international crimes committed in Ukraine. So it is therefore a symbol of the European Union's willingness to step up the efforts to fight impunity across, across the globe. Absolutely. So it's... Uh, it's very short and, and a brief comment to the first question from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, Carrie, can I bring you in now? Thanks, Declan. Um, let me try and offer some, uh, some brief thoughts. Um, I mean, I couldn't agree more that the, the lack of accountability for crimes committed against the, the Syrian people is an, a travesty. Um, I spent a lot of time when I was in New York, again, working with our, our great colleagues from Liechtenstein um, to set up the IIIM for Syria. So I, I absolutely hear what you say. Um, and I think, you know, often this, you know, we encounter this argument that the proposed special tribunal for Ukraine is an example of selectivity. 
precisely because um, you know, other victims have not received justice. And yet we see this extraordinary support for accountability for Ukraine. Why do we also need uh, a special tribunal for aggression? I think that's partly answered by the egregious nature of um, Russia's act of aggression mm -hmm. and the fact that the international rules-based order requires us to respond. But the fact I mean, it, you're right. It, it is an example. I think. I mean, critics are right that it is an example of selectivity. We should own that, and continue to fight to bring justice to all victims. But the fact that you know, the political reality is we might be able to get justice for Ukrainian victims where others have missed out is not a reason not to give justice to the people of Ukraine. That's not going to help the victims in Syria or Yemen or Georgia or any other conflict where there's been little or no justice. Okay, thank you very much for that, Carrie. And on that note, I am going to have to bring this panel discussion to an end, unfortunately. Um, we'll be breaking shortly for coffee. Um, I, I've been asked to, to advise those watching on Zoom that your screen is going to go black for a, a brief period. Uh, the broadcast has not ended. It's simply that the rest of us are having coffee. And um, But um, before bringing this to a close, I'd like to thank very much our uh, panellists. And I'd be very grateful if you give them a, a round of applause for a very stimulating discussion. Thank you very much.